something about it just, I've always liked cars, guns, and cameras. Cars and guns have got me in trouble. Cameras haven't. So at nine or 10 years old, maybe, at the end of the World War II, uh, I started cutting pictures of cameras out of magazines and pasting them in a scrapbook and writing the cost, the price in pencil. And they were cut out precisely. Then I got sloppy later on and started just cutting them out like that. But uh, this is it, just page after page after page of cameras. What a, what a revelation. A head shrinker would have a field day with that. But that may be what started me. My so, fascination with the camera, not with photography, with the camera. And this has been my life doing pictures, and it's never just been a job. It's been my life. In a shot of Johnny Cash at San Quentin doing sound check, I said, Johnny, let's do a shot for the warden. Monterey was his first gig in the United States as Jimi Hendrix. And he comes out at the last number and he had a can of Ronson on lighter fluid. You can see it in the picture. And he's like, starts burning the guitar, man. And it was amazing. He wrote his name down forever that night at Monterey, man. I was like, whew. I was the only photographer that photographed the last Beatle concert. And they're coming onto the stage for the dressing room. And I was on the field with them. And I don't think the audience could even hear shit. You know, it was just, they were screaming. I mean, it was, that day, August 29, 66, was right out of Hard Day's Night. It was that crazy. A lot of the photographers in the 60s, when, you know, the music photography really started to take off, were documenting a part of our history without really knowing it. We were being historians without knowing it. She's been my assistant off and on for 12 years. We've had one fight in 12 years, and that was over antibiotic sabacitracin, if you can believe it or not. It was the dumbest fucking fight in the world. <laughs> it was. I trust her with no reservations. That, that's the bottom line. And what a godsend that is. It's a blessing. I had just been diagnosed when I met Jim and started working with him. Yeah. That's right, huh? Yeah, yeah, I did. It, it hit me probably about two weeks later and I woke up in a cold sweat and I was crying because I realized I have a chronic illness that has no cure. And it was at that point that I wanted to pick up a telephone and talk to somebody and just say, I'm really scared. I, you know, I have no idea what's going on. And that's really why I'm so proud of MS Friends and how MS Friends came about is out of that personal experience of mine really wishing I had somebody that I could call at two in the morning. I never go a day without thinking I have MS. Um, and I hate it, I hate MS. It's a, it's a terrible disease and I, and I hate that it affects people the way it does. But what I hate even more is the fact that people feel alone and nobody should ever have to feel alone and that's what MS Friends is about. It is a young disease, MS. The average age of diagnosis is 30, which means people had symptoms in their 20s. But I think the important thing that we're trying to do with Rock for MS is really reach out to that, that young group of people and let them know that it's, it's okay, you can still live your life with a chronic illness, and it doesn't have to rule your life. But you do have to confront it you know, you can still do something about it. You can change it. You can make a difference by talking to somebody about MS. And then they go out in the world and tell somebody else. I believe in her and I believe in what she's doing. That's why I give total support. Uh, that's, even, that's, only, that's my reason, very selfish, because I love her. So it's a very selfish reason for me, because I want to see her succeed. And it's so important that Jim um, supports me, yeah. totally. Yeah. And, uh, With you know, no questions, you know, no yeah. questions. Yeah, and he's a great friend. Good, good, good. Go get the best of <laughs> <laughs>